I, I am. We're just gonna test it. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, I'm SJ Klein. I'm a Wikipedian, and I've also been working with Alec and others on a, a public AI network. And um, this talk is about cultural technologies. Uh, in, in the spirit of technologies that are used to transmit culture, or that change how we talk to one another and how we pass on what we know and what our, you know, what our ancestors knew and the things that collectively we understand in small groups and in large groups. And um, I want to start with Wikimedia and go back a little bit. This will be, there'll be a little bit of a workshopping time in the end. I'm really curious what people here think we might want to design for upcoming cultural technologies. But I'll start with a bit of wiki history, talk about new modes for transmitting culture that we're all living through now, where we are today, and what we want to pass on. Here are some links for this talk. If you like to cheat and read ahead, there are these slides, and there's a white paper on what we might think about in terms of building public AI infrastructure. Welcome. There are no seats, but you can. So let's start with Wikipedia. Uh, and let's start with a little bit of web history. Before Wikipedia, there were many iterations of the idea that we should all come together and share knowledge. It is a human drive as old as time. And even when the World Wide Web was just being imagined and some of the first logos were coming together, the first logo says, let's share what we know. That's 1989. So fast forward 12 years, Ward Cunningham and other people have been building little personal knowledge bases for a long time that they called wikis. People use them to hyperlink a bunch of notes on their desktops. And he really wants to put that online and let him, himself and all of his students edit together all the pages that they're reading. Publishes this book a few months after Wikipedia is founded on the WikiWay, collaboration on the web. If you, if you read the tiny print in this book that he puts out way before there were wiki communities, he talks about wikis as a way to build community. Because for him, it was just a way to get his group of fellow readers and, and paper analysts and, and punsters to all edit in the same place. Let me get Wikipedia, first logo, even more than our current logo, really emphasized what we were doing together. And for a time, Wikipedia was a significant part of what search engines found on the web because it was there for everyone. It was mirrorable. There were tens of thousands of forks and mirrors. At some point before Google figured out how to de-index them, like more than 1% of all of the search results were some website that had a copy of Wikipedia stored somewhere for Google juice. And then a few years after that, people started talking about how we're editing reality because Wikipedia really is for everyone. It started to penetrate. It took a long time for people to not think of it as a website, but as a way to update and change how we all thought about the world. And then that brings us to now. People are thinking about how AI engages with Wikipedia, and the first instinct is always to say, oh, maybe AI is eating Wikipedia. But is that taking from the sum of human knowledge, or is this actually the natural propagation? This, it, it, this, this feels a lot like the initial burst of mirrors and forks done by everyone. So what does this say for AI? In the wiki moment, for about 10 years, people didn't use the word wiki if they weren't, if they weren't wiki editors. They didn't think of it as a way of being. Uh, they thought of it as a website or a small number of tools. But at this point, if you ask people who grew up with it, it's a way of engaging and interacting. So imagine what it would look like if we helped shape the narratives and the norms around how people thought about AI as a way to transmit culture. A lot of people are thinking in an accelerated way about what the potential harms and benefits are because we've been through this with the web, we've been through this with other forms of automation. In that universe, when we say public AI, really we mean once you're thinking about how to increase benefits and provide public systems, how do you do that? And the essential features of these kinds of things, as with wikis, are public access, public accountability, public oversight, maybe public funding, collective support for the enterprise. It could include public options, national services, nonprofit services. But in general, how we collectively invest our time into building something together. There are some living documents that an international group who are talking about how their countries and regions and nonprofits are building tools can learn from one another. Uh, this is an 
open editable document. I invite everyone to join in and read and, and comment. Actually, this version now has comments closed, but come talk to me afterwards. We're about to release a copy of this at a launch party at the Library of Congress in the US. But these are all the organizations that at some point have contributed thoughts and ideas to what might come next. So I want to open the floor to the people here who are all thinking in the realm specifically of wikis and collaboration and all the research and all the work that you do and the ways that you contribute to capture knowledge. What is it? How should we think about engaging, first of all, with all the AI tools that are describing themselves as a new mode of knowledge production? Generators that are just producing some flavor of how the world really is. OpenAI just released a beta version of ChatGPT search, and like a lot of the, you know, like, like perplexity pages and other AI tools that are trying to just give an answer to your questions because the first generation of really popular AI tools have been language models, they've had chat interfaces, people interact with them expecting that it's like a reference desk. So you're going to ask some kind of question and you'll get an answer. Um, not that you're engaging with a system that you might want to annotate or update or modify. Uh, are there principles that we want to propagate from wiki culture? How could we do that? Do we want something that's fully editable the way that the initial wiki was? Anything that you see, you can edit, you can view the source and the history and figure out how to make changes. And how does this change our identity in this community as knowledge gatherers and curators? How might it affect that identity for the rest of society? And then how does this affect the rest of the library? We mostly think about reference, but people are also using these tools now uh, to generate primary sources. So first off, uh, any questions, thoughts on the presentation? And secondly, if you have thoughts on some of these questions, I would love to hear them. How are you currently using generative tools in your own knowledge production or knowledge assessment? That's not for me, that's for them. Check, check. Yesterday during the discussion, the panel discussion, there, were, uh, there was somebody who said that it's quite difficult to have open weights. Uh, even though we have a hugging phase, they are releasing their open source model. Mm -hmm. And training these models are quite uh, consume a lot of money and energy. And people do not like Wikimedia Foundation doesn't want to invest so much of money in these systems. So when so when I see public AI and the number of institutions that are present, are they willing to train the models, or is it more about um, I don't know using these models because using the models is one side, but training the model can takes a lot of money and also a lot of energy. And it's, I think it's very, very difficult to do the former, uh, to the, do the later, sorry. It's not trivial, that's for sure. Uh, neither was indexing the web back in the day. <laughs> and the nice thing about being a, an international group that you saw on that list is it includes a number of countries that have a notion of sovereign AI. They want to have an entire stack of horizontal services and platforms that are grounded in references and data sources gathered by the country, not necessarily the National Library, but some network defined by the country, uh, trained in country, and providing services whose primary audience is often residents or citizens or people who come uh, to government entities for public services. There are also fully open source communities that are training their own models through networks. There's sometimes networks of researchers and they're each contributing a bit of compute and power from their institutions. But for a lot of uses, it's true that the cost to train the biggest, most interesting frontier model is that like expands to fill the available funding. And so in the moment where there's a surge of funding going into a small number of orgs, the the top of the envelope can be quite large, but the cost it takes to train last year's cutting edge models is dropping very quickly. Any 
quiet audience. Let's try a different angle. <laughs> uh, raise your hand if, when you think about the engagement of AI and knowledge production, you're primarily anxious rather than enthusiastic. Surely not just one person. So, <laughs> thank you. So, in that sense, what are the things, what are the ways that we can contribute to the community of knowledge production which is growing up around those workflows that draw on the things that we've learned as a community that we think have been important in building real, lasting cultural knowledge? Check, check. Hi. Susanna Ones, I, we just uh, recently uh, arranged this AI sauna, and one of the nicest uh, <laughs> outcomes, or like um, quotes from the presenters, was from Osmo Suomen and from the National Library of Finland, which is of course not a, like a response to all this, but <laughs> just uh, use the smallest AI possible. And uh, I think this might be interesting in this context as well, that um, we can talk about different scales. Yeah, I like that a lot. And there is definitely a sense in which wiki culture was often use the worst possible thing that could work and allow things to develop in order to fit the need rather than trying to build an elaborate system and assume that the system is going to magically get things right. Sage? From the perspective of transmitting and sharing cultural knowledge, I think one of the chief virtues that I see in wikis is the way that they let you dig deeper into the connections between things and dig into the sources and, and sort of figure out how the sausage was made, right? Most people don't do that, but the fact that you can means that you can interrogate um, what you're getting from a wiki in a much more robust way than you can with most other things, especially on the web, but even like books and other things, this, it's another level of being able to dig into it. Um, and that seems like what's almost entirely missing from most commercial AI technologies. So I would expect that to be kind of a central plank of what a public AI would, would do differently. I like that a lot. There's this nice project out of Stanford called Storm which is a project that tries to generate hot, densely referenced article style um, overviews of, in response to queries. And they are explicitly thinking about matching some of the Wikipedia feel and style. And one of the nice features of their, of their tool, if you search for oval hyphen storm, you can find their GitHub repo, uh, when you get an output rendered from their system, they have a little button that says, see the brainstorming. And they just show you how they broke down whatever you wrote into a step-by-step -step sequence of questions. And you can see the answers to a lot of those questions is actually, I don't know. So they've, they've, they've added some umbrella context that says, you know, here's a threshold below which uh, we don't want any answer. But then you can see the individual responses. And I don't think right now you can edit the components, but presumably the affordance is there. Hello, I'm Harald from German Wikipedia. Um, my biggest concern about AI is the feedback loop. Mm -hmm. I have an example I read yesterday on German Wikipedia. Uh, there is a controversial person described in an article and on the, uh, uh, the talk page to this article, uh, an editor wrote, here is what I got from ChatGPT about this person, and it wasn't controversial at all. But if you know the editor, what not much people knew, it is the person itself who wanted to write something nice. He f tries to manipulate this article for ages. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a human in the feedback loop, mm. but doesn't help. 
So you specifically here, you're talking about the feedback loop where people assign extra trust if they think the output came from ChatGPT. Yeah. There's also the opposite feedback loop where people who don't trust it see it because it ends up in some article that in, that incorporated it. Yeah, I think there is a, one of the aspects of what Sage mentioned, being able to see the full history, extends to how you provide context and provenance for the things that are, that are written. And one of the wiki norms that I, I wish we would find better ways to name is the way we do dense inline citations. It's the idea of saying it's not enough to have a little bibliography of links at the end of an article. It, it, it actually relevant. There are readers who will want to know which source said which statement. And even most news and, and news organizations and journalists don't currently do that. And I don't have a concise name for that like knowledge transmission style, but it's very important. And having something like that could at least make visible what's going on. Um, the reputation question is harder. Um, I have a quick question. Um, I'm Subhashish. Um, I think knowledge that is concentrated in North America and Western Europe is not the sum of all knowledge. We all have to mm -hmm. agree about that. Uh, how do you plan to address the knowledge gaps that exist in the majority world uh, through public AI? A lot of public AI is making sure that the mechanisms for building AI systems are available and are accessible to people in every community. So the version of having knowledge available in your own language might be having the tools to build these dense knowledge transmission units from your own set of sources. And that can be used both to fill knowledge gaps and also to preserve knowledge bubbles. But that feels like, I mean, I, I would like to hear other ideas for how to do it. That's, that's currently the prominent way that it gets talked about. People talk about it in terms of local autonomy and uh, preserving some version of local agency. But you still have to gather the data. There still has to be a gap-filling data set out there. And sometimes that takes extra work that hasn't yet been done. But there's also a huge risk in data gathering publicly. Um, mm -hmm. I had made a lot of mistakes while editing Wikipedia, and when I look at Google Translate and uh, Bing Translator, I see those mistakes um, being reflected when I try to translate something from English to my native language. Mm -hmm. um, that basically means that Wikipedians are contributing to Wikipedia assuming good faith, and their uh, contribution is scraped off of the internet that is used for machine learning, and then, uh, you know, um, that is basically uh, creating garbage um, when people are using ChatGPT. And uh, even if it's garbage, it is still their labor, and they are not getting anything in return of that labor, and not even attribution. And that is a clear violation of the CC um, licenses. There has to be attribution. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm a little bit unclear how um, public AI would address these particular issues, as um, uh, another colleague said. It's really expensive to build uh, language models. And uh, probably Wikimedia movement doesn't have that kind of infrastructure and resources to build uh, new language models that will be fair, that would be um, freely accessible to all, uh, and will still ensure that there is uh, attribution, at least, for labor or compensation of some form. Many communities across the world don't have the bandwidth and uh, capacity and uh, availability of volunteer time to contribute data uh, that they would not get anything back in return for. Uh, yeah, those, those questions are still out there in the open. Yeah, absolutely. There are, so there are two parts to that. One is um, if it is possible for organizations like ours to do their own training from their own data sets in a way that preserves attribution, assuming that that was a solved problem. I think the answer is yes. 
some of the some some of the current effective, if not cutting edge models, they they cost something to train, but they cost on the order of a million dollars of compute to train, and the cost of compute is dropping very quickly. And those are still very useful for a lot of the things that we do, like summarization and c categorization and curation. Um, there is a there are some unsolved problems in attribution, and uh, depending on how you train your models, uh, attribution can be can be more or less difficult. And that's that is just an excellent research challenge that I think we are not the only ones who want to solve. Um, my view, which I think is shared by a lot of the people working on public AI, is that we should identify the best current uh, solutions for preserving attribution and incorporate them into like, the standard expectations of tools and platforms that call themselves public AI. Oh, thank you. You could also give three points of input. Jonathan from Wikimedia Deutschland. I'm an AI developer, so like I'm not a skeptic, but I do have a question about resource um, prioritization. Mm -hmm. If you're working on public AI, especially with uh, otherwise under-resourced communities, you're still talking, to, to train a $7 billion model is a, is a million dollars. So that's not what we're talking about. But to fine tune one could be a few thousand dollars. It's the running the operation for a year with a collection of GPUs that's gonna cost uh, significant resources, possibly an entire set of salaries. And so when you're engaging with these communities in the public sector, how do you convince them um, or, or, or otherwise justify using that resource? Because again, it's not the training at this level, it's, it's the, the, the years long operations of, of hardware, of new expensive hardware. Yeah. That there, I don't have, by the way, so. Yet. There's, um, there are some nice projects that try to solve this coordination problem because I think it's partly a coordination problem in that if you already have a, a center or a data fabric that is committed to being around for those 10 years or five years, then figuring out how to use it for multiple projects that it's useful across a range of, of users and communities can be tractable. Uh, there is a group called NDIF in the US the National Deep Inference Fabric. And it tries to solve this problem not for fine-tuning um, underrepresented language models, but for fine-tuning evaluations of black box models, which was a specific type of research that was only accessible to researchers at large universities. And so they said, researchers at every university should be able to do this. We will make sure that we have a setup that works um, and that is hosting all of the current models that are out there, and anyone who wants to come do research can do it, and we will get, we will aggregate those costs, and like they bundled it into an NSF grant, and they got five years of funding. That, that might be more overhead than one wants for just that level of surface, but I think that is an argument that we could also make to governments or to larger institutions. Um, one of the things that uh, a fundamental problem that uh, they have with AI, with AI. Uh, computers, what computers can do easily and people can do easily are often very different things. And the upshot sometimes turns out to be uh, output from AI that people would describe as weird. And the, it may be that's surmountable, but it, it seems that without uh, it, it, the, with the state of play we're at certainly now and for a reasonable amount of the future, somehow there has to be a human in the loop or things become very strange indeed. Yeah, I agreed. That's one of the areas where I feel the wikis are a nice example where the super majority of edits on wikis are done through automation, but there are always people in the loop. Just to close out, we have a comment um, from Thad saying it's super important the acknowledgement that AI the AI has to help deliver the promise on linked data. And as AI is linking us fast, we can scan millions of links, triple, facts triple, that summarize that in a view. For a human, gathering and running rabbit holes can take months. I can see the reference as a major gap in AI, just to make sure that we remain the gaps within Wikipedia. And at that, we're out of time. Thanks, Thad. Thank, Thank you so you much. All.